that when the next liquidity crisis hits, and we are already seeing signs of that, signs which I will show you coming up, and the CPI is still very high, and the Fed must reverse or watch the banking system implode, that's when there will be a flight away from the dollar into precious metals, silver by the public, and gold by the banks. And today, we're going to go into the bowels of the 1970s Federal Reserve by looking at old transcripts to see what was going on in these people's heads. And there is more humility on the 1970s Fed, the late 1970s Fed, than you might think, something which I am sure is completely absent from today's Federal Open Market Committee. I don't see a smidge of humility by anyone on that board, and I don't think anybody else does either. And what does this have to do with silver? Mainly, there was a fundamental change in strategy in the late 1970s when the Fed actually did become serious on stopping consumer price increases. I don't like to call it inflation because inflation is an increase in the money supply that leads to that, as you all know. There was a big change in strategy. We're going to read about it word for word, right out of their mouths, and why what the Fed is doing now is not even close to what they were doing back then. And there is no way, even technically, that they could even accomplish what the Fed of the late 1970s did, even if they tried. And what does this have to do with silver? Well, silver right now is in a holding pattern. It is holding in a three-week coil, very tight price structure, not moving up or down very much. Traders are waiting for a trigger. My hunch is that when the next liquidity crisis hits, and we are already seeing signs of that, signs which I will show you coming up, and the CPI is still very high, and the Fed must reverse or watch the banking system implode, that's when there will be a flight away from the dollar into precious metals, silver by the public, and gold by the banks. Exactly how far we are away from that, I can't tell you. But what I can say with confidence is that there will only be one more financial crisis. There won't be two. There's one more, and when it hits, that will be the end game. So let's begin by going deep into the bowels of the late 1970s Federal Reserve. Right here is a transcript from October 6th, 1979. This was at the peak of the dollar crisis, about three months before gold and silver topped, gold at 72, silver at about 50, at a 15 to one ratio around. Now here we have a comment by what looks to be a guy named Mr. Balls. The chairman of the Fed is now Paul Volcker. He took over in August of this year, 1979. And here Mr. Balls says, I think there is a wide perception from the standpoint of the Fed's responsibilities and functions that there has simply been such excessive monetary growth in the last six months that we aren't making any progress on the inflation front. Fred's comment about Scylla and Charybdis coming together is a very apt analogy, I'm afraid. We've all been struggling with this problem in that if we know a recession is probably in prospect, we normally would want to ease policy somewhat. Some of us felt so strongly about that last spring that we dissented. The record will show that we thought policy ought to be easing. He's talking about himself here. Since that time, inflationary developments and inflation expectations have become even more dangerous. So here, Mr. Balls is admitting that he was wrong about policy easing, because if inflation expectations are getting even worse now with tightening, and, and at this point, interest rates are in the double digits, then he was wrong about easing, and that shouldn't have happened. Now, here's the key paragraph. And this is the change in the Fed strategy that took place in the late 1970s and sort of an emergency move. One definite advantage that I see in moving to this new operating target of reserves, what does that mean? An operating target of reserves means they're targeting the money supply itself. They're looking at the aggregates, how much money is in the banking system, and they are targeting that using interest rates to moderate monetary growth, to moderate actual inflation rather than setting a rate target and moderating the money supply in order to keep the target range of rates intact. The operating target of reserves is that it's likely to result in greater credibility in the marketplace on the part of a great many observers here and abroad that we will do something more effective than we're done, say, in the past six months in slowing down the rate of monetary growth. And here he sums up the strategy. This is the key sentence. If anything, I think the argument for adding a reserves target, meaning a money supply target, with a considerably wider range of possible movements in the federal funds rate to make it effective is stronger now than it was then, particularly in view of the explosive inflationary psychology that we have today. 
And so here we have the Federal Open Market Committee members commenting on a change in strategy. No longer will they be targeting a federal funds target and tweaking the money supply in order to stay within the federal funds range. They will be using interest rates to target a money supply objective. And that is ultimately what calmed consumer price increases in the late 1970s and ended the gold and silver bull market. It was an actual responsible policy by the Federal Reserve of the late 1970s, which had some humility. And you see members admitting that they were wrong when they were wrong and they got things under control. But now we do not have these people. They are all gone. All we have are crazy eyed people like Cash Carry in charge of the money printing. Let's go to a different transcript to see what was happening at the peak of the dollar panic of 1980. This is a transcript from February 5th, 1980. This is about two weeks after the peak in gold and silver had hit, but they didn't know it was a peak. Hindsight is 2020. They thought maybe it could keep going even higher and would freak them out. So here, Mr. Wynn, an FOMC member, implores Paul Volcker, chairman. Paul, I hear more doubts being raised in more areas than I ever thought possible. Their suspicion is that we are not on a money target, rather very much a funds target. So you see here, even when they are targeting the money supply, which is would be the correct strategy for a central bank that is actually trying to control consumer price increases. He's complaining that the public doesn't even believe them, that they have no credibility, and that is true. Interest rates kept rising to keep control of the money supply through the middle of 1981. So there was another year of this until finally they got things under control to put us in the current bubble that we are still in and we are at the end phases of it, and this time there is no recovery possible. When the mainstream says that the Fed can orchestrate a soft landing without any crises or monetary troubles, they're essentially saying that for the first time in recorded history, you can stop an inflationary process, by which I mean an expansionary monetary process, and nothing bad will happen to the economy and its current structure. This is not going to be the first time ever that the Fed can stop monetary inflation and keep things under control. It has never happened before in history and it will not happen now. You not only need increasing money supply, but you need an increasing rate of increasing money supply in order to sustain an increasingly larger bubble. How do we know that we are right on the precipice of the next liquidity crunch? Well, I'll let the FT handle that. Take it away, FT. Liquidity is terrible. Poor trading conditions fuel Wall Street tumult. Small trades are triggering outsized price swings in the world's biggest capital markets. Traders' ability to seamlessly buy and sell stocks, bonds, and other financial products on Wall Street has deteriorated sharply this year, adding fuel to the big swings on the world's biggest and deepest capital markets. Liquidity across the U.S. markets is now at its worst level since the early days of the pandemic 2020, according to investors and big U.S. banks who say money managers are struggling to execute trades without affecting prices. And so the beginnings of the next liquidity crunch are already here. From here, the process is known. About exactly how fast we get to the peak of this, I don't know. But there's only one direction to go in now until the Fed reverses. And the Fed will reverse. And at the point, it will probably kill the dollar pretty quickly. And so everything that the gold and silver bugs and silver backs or gorillas, apes, etc., whatever we want to call ourselves, whatever we say, whatever we've been saying, it hasn't happened yet, but when it does happen, it's going to be fast and people are not going to have time to adapt. You need to be in before, you need to be in early, you need to be in when everyone's making fun of you because that's how money is made. Now, as we saw the exponentially increasing money supply since 1980, here we have a graph from, looks like 1995, of the three-month treasury bill. And I will show you what's special about the three-month treasury bill in a second. You have a downtrend line here. Once the downtrend line is hit, interest rates are going to have to go down or the bubble is going to pop. Where is that line? It looks to be around 2% on the three-month bill. And why is the three-month bill so special? Let's move to SIFMA. An Excel put together by SIFMA, latest data for May 2022. You see here, this is the monthly issuance of 13-week bills, the three-month treasury bill. Now, if we do a shift here, go all the way up the column, you see here, if you follow my plus sign and arrow, it says here, sum, in the bottom right corner of my screen, it says 7.501, that's $7.5 trillion. That's how much 13-week bills have been issued since January 2020. It's more than any other column, 7.5 trillion. For the eight-week, we have 5.2 trillion. For the four-week, we have 5.375 trillion. 
26 week, that's the six month bill. We have 6.8 trillion. This is by far the biggest, 7.5 trillion. This is the bread and butter of the federal government's short-term financing. When the interest rates on that bill go up, that means they can't raise as much money in that pocket. And there's going to be problems, especially when the next recession hits, which is going to have to increase government spending. Who's going to buy all the bills? Only the Fed. And the amount of monetary inflation in the banking system is going to go through the roof. It's going to get vertical. Here's a longer term view of the same three month bill. See here, the same trend line has been in place since what looks like the 1985. And again, we have this trend line somewhere at around 2%. When that is hit, the bubble will probably pop and the Fed will have to reverse and that will be the end of the dollar. And so let's talk about silver for a second. This is a silver report. This is the silver to commodity ratio. It's very close to the silver to oil ratio. And we, this is really silver's purchasing power in real terms. And it bottomed, it looks like in 2005, and we have been in a bull market ever since. Now, we had a trend line that was established during the 2008 financial crisis that wasn't tested until right now. Here is the silver top in 2011. You can see in 2020, in August 2020, silver exceeded its 2011 top in real purchasing power terms and commodity terms. And the bull market, sorry, the bear market since then has been extreme. We've fallen from a top of what looks to be close to 0 0.09, close to about 0 0.027. What is the number on that? I think it's a 70% fall. It's by far the largest fall of silver in real commodity terms since this bull market began. And we are at the trend line now for the first time since 2008. We're in the final stretch. The signs of a liquidity crunch are gathering. And when that happens, the Fed is going to have to reverse. And when the Fed reverses, it will be the last time. Absorb the ridicule. It will pass. And remember, this will not be the very first time in human history that a bubble doesn't pop when interest rates rise.